Well, here we are, round two of the show, and Dennis Dyken has joined us. And you know, the funny thing is, this happens quite a bit on this program. The conversation that we should have had on the air, we just had. Well, if you want to talk about the Abbott and Costello TV show, I'm, I'm game for continuing. I, you know, listen, I'm all for it. We could talk about Abbott and Costello until the cows come home. Grown men sitting in a radio, radio studio. <laughs> Grown men doing nothing, talking about cows, Lou. So what I thought we would do is talk a little bit about some uh, records, some records that maybe we're into right now and play them for the audience. Mm -hmm. And then we can kind of talk about other things that are happening in your in your personal life. Okay. <laughs> so let's start off with uh, your first pick. Oh, it's hard to choose three songs, you know, but I just saw what was lying around and just whatever popped into my mind. Uh, this is She's My Girl by The Turtles, 1967. I forget, it might be written by Bonner and Gordon. I don't recall offhand, but uh, I guess we could check that real quick. Let me take a look here. You're absolutely correct. Yeah, who penned a number of hits for the group and others. And were they not in that group, the Magicians, Bonner and Gordon? Possibly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wrote... Uh, possibly, Lou. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> possibly they were. She'd and, rather be with me. And yeah. One of those great hits. So uh, this, to me, is two and a half minutes of the most glorious moments of, of recorded sound. It's just a stunning recording the dynamics to it and uh, and there's a drum roll right before the outro that i think is godlike johnny barbeda on drums the great johnny barbeda is on drums and uh he is, ha, has always been one of my biggest role models growing up as a drummer and he he was kind of cut from the same cloth as dino dinelli from the rascals you can tell that they both had uh, jazz grounding that informed their playing, and they swung like crazy and had real deep, deep bags of tricks and uh, just were exciting players. And There's so much else to the Turtles to talk about, but I always gravitate towards Johnny Barbado. And you can hear more conversation like this on your radio show, oh. and maybe even this song, correct? Oh, um, I have played it, yes. Yes, uh, on Denny's Den. Den. Denny's Den on uh, WFMU.org. We're, we're allowed to mention other... Of course. <laughs> right. It's a streaming On show. another network. <laughs> yeah, right. Back to, well, I'm, I, as is my want, I, many times before I uh, fall asleep, I'll watch some old television show on, on my phone, and I'll... A lot of times I watch uh, What's My Line. It's a big yes. favorite of mine. I love that. Never show. get tired. It ran so many seasons, too. But they will actually say, well, uh, Bennett Surf is appearing on another uh, show next week on another network. But they won't say what network it is. But uh, thank you. It's WFMU.org, and it's a streaming show. It's on Wednesdays 2 to 4 on the Rock and Soul stream on WFMU. Uh, it's also archived, so it's there 24-7 for your pleasure. I don't know if you have picked up on this watching What's My Line, but Bennett Surf seems to have the inside track on all the beautiful Hollywood starlets. No matter it who it is, yeah. you know, they'll, they'll come out, and everybody will be stumped, and he'll say, are you happen to be the star of the movie Baby Doll, which is playing right? Now? Yes, it is. Oh, it's Carol Baker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he seems to get them all immediately. Is it Stephanie Powers? <laughs> Are you Anita Ekberg? Yeah. I, I can feel. I can, I can sense your presence. Right. Did you know that there uh, on YouTube? It's a, a several part uh, oral history of what's my line as told by Bennett Surf. Oh, really? It's fascinating wow he talks behind the scenes you know and of course we were all making good money doing it and uh you know it, it, that was the, but but we enjoyed being together it, it's really a deep dive and it's it's a couple hours i think i recommend it well I, it sounds pretty good to me yeah. i'm sure there's a lot of dorothy kilgallen talk yeah, yeah it's that's a still story. a mystery isn't yeah, it? yeah i wonder i mean gee whiz that's and so, you know the episode of the night she died she yes. Appear, it was a Sunday night. Yes. And that's on YouTube. You could find that. There's another great episode of What's My Line from the um, February 9th, 1964. Uh, the night the Beatles appeared sure. on Ed Sullivan. And they're all kind of 
they're all kind of giddy about it and kind of uh, snooty about it at the same time. Uh, and there are some very interesting guests on uh, around. I think that night there was a, a related guest, uh, a Fab Four related okay. guest. I know Pete Best was on I've Got a Secret. Yes, this is right. this is something else. Okay. I recommend watching it. And it's great because Bennett Surf says, and now let's welcome John Ringo Daly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, speaking of which, that kind of leads into my first pick. I can't let this go without playing something from Cliff Richard and the Shadows. Yeah. So, we're going to play something from a CD that I picked up, and I, it's gotten a lot of use because it's been destroyed. And it's Rare B-Sides, 1963 to 1989. Hmm. There's a misconception that when the Beatles came along in Britain and in the U.S., that all the previous groups were kind of wiped out and we didn't hear from them again. That's obviously not true. They they continue to have success. I think in the case of Cliff and the Shadows, other acts like Marty Wilde and Tommy Steele had already kind of faded away. So Cliff and the Shadows were still going. But these B-sides, it's, it's a cliche, but they're better than the A-side. Oh, so wow. this is from 1964, and it's a song that the Shadows wrote called True True Lovin'. And it's the flip of a hit called Constantly, which was an Italian song that was given English lyrics. It's a big ballad with strings, but the flip side is a rockin' number from The Shadows, and it's in that sort of Mersey Beat oh. style of 1964. So let's give it a listen. True, true lovin'. Well, there we go. Little Cliff Richard in The Shadows, 1964 style. As That's a song that I've been playing a lot lately. Let me ask you something, Ghosty. Sure. The Shadows always played on their own records. Is that yes. right? God, it sounded like Bobby Graham on drums. No, that was Brian Bennett's. It was, huh? Yeah. Wow. So, moving on. What you got? Ah. We're a winner by the impressions. Ooh. I think it's cut number 24 on that disc. And what year is this? 1968. All right. This record knocked my socks off when it came out. I was always a fan of the Impressions, but this was like a new phase Impressions. The rhythm really became uh, pronounced on this, and that was the year I got my first drum kit, you know, and, and I was really drawn to the... Well, I always was drawn to rhythm on the records on the radio. I think the, the, the cuts that got me started were Four Seasons, uh, those records, Leslie Gore, the drumming on those, and Phil Spector records, of course, Hal Blaine. That really made me want to play drums. And so, anyway, this one uh, is another, just, it's a fierce groove, and I just love everything about this record. Uh, and I bought it at Corvette's in Woodbridge in 1968. I'll never forget that day. It just makes you want to hear more. It's over yeah. so quick. It's, it's, it's the it's, perfect length. I and, you know, Curtis Mayfield, ah, what a talent read his biography recently. I recommend it. Well, we are going to get a little noisy. Mm. And this is a song that I'm sure everyone out there has heard. I think the first time I it escaped me for so many years, but the first time I heard it, I was working in the city and I used to take the subway all the time. And I was on the A train and I would crank up the music as loud as possible because my hearing was bad anyway. I just kept making it worse. To drown out everything, and I was listening to Come to the Sunshine, the Andrew Sandoval oh, yeah. show, uh -huh. and he played, and I always get it wrong, Dave D. Dave D. D, 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 D. <laughs> I always forget, too. Yeah. Dave D. Beaky. Oh. Mick and Titch. What's the full uh, litany there? I think it's Dave D. Dave D. Dozy. 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 See, I keep, we were why do I keep forgetting? <laughs> <laughs> why do I forget Dozy? I mean, it's the most, uh, well, I guess Beaky's uh, odd too. Dave D., Dozy, Beaky, Mick, and Titch. So I'm listening to this, and it's just one of those, uh, and it doesn't happen too often these days, sadly, but it's one of those things where uh, you hear a song and you're like, oh, this just hits me at the right spot. And I was on the subway and I was feeling great. And I just kept rewinding this Come mm. to the Sunshine so I could hear it over and over again. Mm -hmm. So it's a very famous song called Hold Tight. This is a good argument for the mono version of records mm. because I did hear a stereo version when I 
was researching it, I said, oh, let me get the stereo version. And the stereo version just neuters the song mm -hmm. because it opens with this powerful punk rock slamming and it's just this wall of noise in your face. Mm -hmm. And then the, the stereo version, just it's limp. So we're going to hear the mono version of Hold Tight. That's us. And Dennis Dyken of the Smithereens is joining us this afternoon. And you know what? I think the last time I had a musician in the studio live with me, rather than uh, an interview over the phone, it was uh, a member of Jay and the Americans. So you're in good company. What was his name? Do you remember? Uh, Marty, yeah, Marty Sanders. Marty. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, yes. he, he's around these parts. I, I love their records. You know, I, I love a lot of those New York records from that yes. era. Uh, you know, the the Wrecking Crew, of course, got so much ink. Rightly so. I mean, sure. don't get me wrong. I'm all about that. But unfortunately, the New York players, there's not as much documentation. And it wasn't Hollywood. And they just don't, uh, like, drummers like Gary Chester, Buddy Saltzman. Buddy was the main drummer on the Four Seasons records. People don't talk about them that much. Like everybody in our circles know they're gonna know who Hal Blaine is. Sure. And Tommy Tedesco probably. Carol, Carol Kay. Kay. Right, well, yeah. she sees to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> but you know the New York players and Vinnie Bell and yeah. uh, uh, Paul Griffin, the keyboard player. Just so many. But anyway, so. Um, uh, oh, we were talking. I was going to say, well, how did I get on that? Jay, Jay and the Americans. Yeah, yes, yeah, that was Gary Chester on drums for the most you know, part. I wanted to mention actually about the, the the Wrecking Crew. Have you run across people that were disappointed to learn that the same group of musicians were playing on records? For example, people who love Sonny and Cher but look down on the Monkees, or you know they loved the mamas and the papas but may have looked down on sunny and share records and then to find out that it was the same you know done in the same studio with the same group of musicians it's not always the same people you mm -hmm. know i think the wrecking crew was a later term right they was it used at the time you see i don't remember hearing about it before how blaine was talking about it in the 80s i guess i don't know uh i have a feeling it probably was conjured in the 60s but maybe it didn't stick back then i think right. it became more more of a calling card when hal started uh writing his book you know and um i, I do believe that he, he took it from uh an older musician who stated as hal has said many times these guys are going to wreck the business right it probably did come from that but you know, I re I remember hearing about it in the '60s. I guess when I was a kid, and I heard that the Monkees, because you saw them as a four-piece group, like the Beatles, they're four guys that should be playing their own instruments. Whereas, yeah, the, the moms and papas didn't play drums and stuff. So yeah, I think as a kid, I I, I didn't like that idea. You know what's weird about the the whole monkey scenario? They really didn't play their in uh, on the first sessions, although Peter played on a couple and Mike, but. Uh, that whole era where they didn't play is really about five months. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, because they, they had to immediately go on tour. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. they started recording Headquarters, which is the album where they did play everything, mm -hmm. pretty quickly because mm -hmm. that came out. They started working on that in early 67, like January of 67. So it was out by the summertime. Mm -hmm. Anyway, another tangent. Ah, what do you have next as well, your last uh, pick? Well, you know... It, it kind of goes in line with what we're saying. I guess as a kid, I just always imagined that the Beach Boys played on their own record. And they did play on. Sure. I I maintain that Brian wanted the group to play on their records as much as they could. Because they really did, with very few exceptions, play on their sides through 64. Yeah. You know? Dennis did not play drums on Surf in USA. That was, uh, oh, What's his name? Uh, DeVito. Frank DeVito played drums on that. But that's because Dennis hurt himself, apparently. Right. And um, and our car club is the wrecking crew in 63. Yes. But that track was pegged for the Honeys. Yes. Because they did the original vocals. It was right. called uh, Rabbit's Foot. Something like that, so yes. when Brian was doing his outside productions and trying to create his stable of artists, yeah, he would use outside players. Sometimes he used the Beach Boys. But anyway, um, after... Brian 
retired from the road, of course, he and and that and when his arrangements and productions started flowering and required more finesse and orchestration, yeah, he he used the Wrecking Crew more and more. Uh, but not on this track. This is still uh, one that uh, has Dennis on drums, Carl on guitar, uh, it has Brian on piano, and Russ Teitelman on ashtray. Oh. And it, I believe it was cut during the sessions for their 1964 Christmas album. And I'm talking about one of my very favorite Beach Boys tracks from... Possibly my favorite Beach Boys album, The Beach Boys Today. It's uh, She Knows Me Too Well. I love this song. Yeah. So while this song was playing, this beautiful song, I can't believe I just talked over Brian's, that whining falsetto there at the end. We were mentioning other Beach Boys albums. So I'll tell you my story about Beach Boys 85. Mm -hmm. So I went to Sam Goody, and I had a decision to make. It was either going to be the 1985 Beach Boys album just called Beach Boys with uh, Get You Back as the lead single or the soundtrack to Return of the Living Dead. <laughs> they both came out the same weekend and I bought Return of the Living Dead. I, I walked out of the store and then I was looking at it and I said, I've made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I should own this Beach Boys record. And I turned around and I returned Return of the Living Dead. Still sealed, right? Still sealed. They took it back. I swapped it for the... And I don't regret that. As much as I love some of the cuts on the Return of the Living Dead soundtrack. But, yeah, there, I, I'm such a mark for the Beach Boys that... Me too. Uh, it's, it's really tough. Even somebody posted something the other day about Smiley Smiles' anniversary on this day. Smiley Smiles. And there were all these negative comments from people, well, I've heard the Smile Sessions. Why would anyone enjoy this? And I'm like, no, but this is a totally different... I love Smiley <laughs> Smile. <laughs> I, know, I love it. You know what? Nah, I'm not going to say it. But I love <laughs> Smiley Smile. I think I know where you were going. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know. It's an avant-garde record. Yes. You know? And it's a lot of fun. You know? And, and I love that version of Wind Chimes on there. Yes. I just love it. I love the Smile yeah. version, too. Yeah. But... That version with that fade on it on Smiley Smile. Oh, Fall boy. Breaks Back to Winter, the Woody Woodpecker Suite. Uh, uh, it's incredible. This week on my show, I'm playing the Gary Usher version of that. Oh, Have you ever heard that? No, he, I haven't. He did this orchestrated album of, of Brian's compositions. I think it was recorded in 1970, hmm. but it was only released in, in, in 2004, I think it came out. Anyway, yeah. Fall, well, you know, Fall Breaks is... Fine. Yes, yeah. yes. And Which took that, me years to realize. Well, it, it blew my mind when they put the vocals on fire for the smile sessions. Right, but right. So I have this theory, and I don't know if, I mean, it might be messing around too much, but there are vocal sections that are missing on the smile sessions that we hear on Brian Wilson Presents Smile. But if they had just gotten Al to go in and record just some of the, like in the um, Plymouth Rock do you dig worms to record the verse? I feel like it would have made a huge difference. I would enjoy it a little more. It's a little repetitive, mm -hmm. but if I had his, you know, and I, I pick Al because he's the only one that sounds and Bruce too, you know, that kind of could pass for themselves in 1966. Mm -hmm. Would that be too much tampering? Well, the beach boys tried that because there's a song, Sherry, she needs me, right? Of which course. was cut in 64. Right. Great song. Yeah. And then Brian put a lead vocal on it in 76 or six or seven. Yeah. 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 It's That's interesting. True. Well, but, you know, why not do that and just separate them on the box? Put this is the new version. Right. And here's the unadorned version. Yeah. You know, and no give harm. Al, give Al a little work. Yeah. All right. So my last pick. Mm -hmm. Thank God for European copyright laws. Oh, yeah. There, right? those, those sets? <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Because here I have a Julie London box set. <laughs> 16 albums. 16? 16. 16 albums. What it cost, like 10 bucks? Yes. Yeah. I wanted to play something from her first record, Julie Is Her Name. This is 1955. The song is Laura. Mm. And I feel as if... The 60s, and in some cases the 70s too, have been romanticized at the expense of the 50s. Mm. So 
we're always hearing about how the 50s was so square and there was, you know, there was really nothing uh, counterculture about the 50s. And and that's bunk. I mean, there was so much going on. Link Ray. Right. <laughs> I mean, you've got the whole beatnik scene. Yeah. You've got all those guys. And you have really interesting kind of odd little records. And this is one of them. And I like this version of Laura because it's it starts off a cappella. So there's a very mm. haunting quality to uh, Julie London's version of this song. The band eventually comes in, but you hear it and you sort of envision, I mean, Julie London's really beautiful. And, you know, you sort of envision her like in this weird <laughs> ghostly haze singing this. It's just a, a great little recording. Laura. That's nice. Yeah, it's really, really nice. And kudos uh, to her her husband, Bobby Troop. Yes. Who wrote uh, one of my favorite songs of all time, uh, Their Hearts Were Full of Spring, which, of course, uh, the Beach Boys covered, but the freshman version, the four freshman version is just heavenly, truly heavenly. You know, we couldn't let you leave here today, and I've enjoyed this chat and playing these records, without playing something from this new ish smithereens record ah. so what's the story behind this so i listened to this and i'm like didn't this come out did this come <laughs> out? it sounds like a record that would have come out yeah but it did not we were between labels in 1993 we had a batch of songs we actually had two albums worth of tunes and uh prior to well, we did our first our first two eps and our first lp especially for you in new york and then we went to Los Angeles for Green Thoughts, Eleven, and Blow Up. So we were returning to New York for these sessions. We slept in our own bed, and there was a studio called Crystal on West 19th Street, and we, we booked that, and we reported to the office every day. We, so it was back in New York, and uh, just had, I think it had a different feel to it. So anyway, self-produced, and we had all this material, and we recorded it, and and we most of the tracks are pretty live, you know, band tracks. So anyway, um, shortly after we completed this project, we got signed again to RCA, and uh, twelve of the songs that we did at these sessions ended up being re-recorded for a date with the Smithereens on RCA. So these were kind of the leftover tracks, in a in a sense, from that period, uh, and they were mixed and kind of good to go but we were just moving forward with that, that other material and then subsequently uh as we were on other labels uh, we just wrote new stuff so this remained in the can for however many years i can't do the math that quick i don't know ghosty if you're good with numbers but no i'm not yeah, good i couldn't tell you anything yeah. so we're going through our our extensive uh trove of tapes we have a lot of archival material that we're in the process of getting up and ready to, to release and this was the uh, a batch of tunes that hung together pretty much that we felt hung together as an album so we said okay time time to do it and all it took was sequencing mastering by greg calby and uh digging through my photos to come up with some graphics for the cover and uh, because i usually snap a lot Back then, I was doing a roll a day on the road or in the right. studio. So we found some pictures that captured the mood of the sessions, put them on the cover, and uh, lo and behold, uh, the lost album is no longer lost. Right. <laughs> so we should go out with a track from uh, this record. What would you choose? Well, I'll tell you what. I guess I would go with what we're considering the single. Uh it's called um, Out of This World. It's uh, it's pretty typical Smithereens stash, I would say. Um, so that's my choice. Is that cut one on this record? Should be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I had a feeling based on what you just said. Well, there it is, kids. Available soon? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's out now. Perfect timing. Well, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Thanks for having me, Gusty. I'm I, a big fan of your show. Well, man. I'm a fan of yours, too. And what we need to do is probably 
have microphones that sort of follow us around when we're downstairs and then we come upstairs yeah. so we don't miss, <laughs> miss anything. Well, we'll do it again. We'll sometime. do it again. Yeah. Absolutely. I do want to tell folks that we're planning to do a, a new studio album, too, next year. Oh. A new, new, mu- new music. So I hope folks look for that and uh, we're coming to your favorite town. We're playing our hometown, Carteret, New Jersey, in December. Uh, there's a beautiful new performing arts center built on the footprint of what used to be a block of stores that we would ride our bikes to as kids. Ah. Me, Jimmy, and Mike, and buy comic books and Mad Magazine. They knocked down that block, and they, they built this beautiful performing arts center. We'll be there. I think it's December 3rd. What would have been your favorite comic book? Oh, you know what? Uh, I guess back in the day, Spider-Man. Yeah. yeah. All right. That was my favorite, too. The thing that I was a sucker for, and it's this terrible story, and we're going to wrap up in a second, folks, but (laughs) Mm -hmm. I had a pretty extensive comic book collection in the 80s. And it was all comics from the, I'd say, 1950s up. Wow. And back then, you could go to a comic shop and go to the quarter box. You could buy old comics that they just didn't consider, you know, like uh, old Richie Rich or something, Mm -hmm. you know. But I sold them all. So I could put a down payment on a car. <laughs> the car is long since gone. Yeah. And to this day, I think back of the comics that I had. I had Spider-Man, all the issues from, I want to say, 1973 up till 84 or something like that. But the comics I kept that I couldn't part with were the Archies. Uh-huh. I just couldn't imagine life without... Archie and Betty and Veronica Betty in particular. Veronica, yeah. <laughs> Let's right. be honest. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had Pep, I had Laugh, I had all the iterations of uh, the Archie comic books, and I, I I looked up the value, and they have almost no value. Is that right? Right. <laughs> right. So the one the one thing I coveted that I just couldn't part. But it has personal meaning. And it that's, did. That, that's yes. what really counts. Right. You know, I like comics. Okay, but I was really a lot more into Mad Magazine growing up. I got to say. I started buying books like the best of Dave Berg Mm -hmm. and things like that. But I found that, in actual fact, Mad works in its original context. Like when you start separating like the like the best of Don Mm -hmm. Martin or something, um, it doesn't uh, it doesn't hold together as well as when you have the actual magazine the letters page, which yeah. was always my favorite thing. Oh, that was great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you what. I, that's an interesting observation. I gotta say though, I learned so much as a kid in the '60s and early '70s from reading Mag- Mad Magazine, just about culture and uh, Jewish humor. There was, you know, right. a, a, there was so much uh, of that that was in our in, in our uh, in our culture that I had reference to. Uh, from there and uh just it it really helped shape my sense of humor and my outlook on life and i i still refer to memories of certain things in mad magazine and point to things in the world that oh yeah okay i get it because anyway yes I i feel very fortunate to have had mad magazine uh stuck inside my loose leaf and I, I like the earlier, the Harvey Kurtzman oh, era yeah. of Mad. Yeah, yeah, the artwork. And, oh, man, it's fantastic. Yeah. Talk about 50s subversion. Yes, know? there you go. Yeah. Another example. Oh, we tied it all together in a nice little bow. <laughs> all right, we have to go, folks. Yeah. Make sure to let, when's your show on again? Oh, Wednesday afternoons, 2 to 4 p.m., WFMU.org on the Rock and Soul stream. It's called Denny's Den, but it's available 24-7 on the archives. There you go. All right, we'll see you in a bit, folks.